Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Random Alien Brain Droppings. My name is Suzanne Chancellor, and today's guest is somebody who I think you'll all be familiar with, and I was very fortunate to be able to pull him aside this year at the Experiencers Speak Conference in Maine. We chatted for a little bit, and he agreed that he would do an interview with me, and so I was very thrilled at this prospect. As there are so many things about Peter that I didn't know, and I was very surprised to find out that he was an experiencer. So that was something that I had never heard before from him or about him. So I was very interested to find out exactly what it was. Now, upon that, he shared his bio with me, and I was very surprised to find out that not only was he the co-author of Left to Descate, um, which he co-authored with Larry Warren, but he also had an art degree and a degree in history and was an, a, an accomplished painter. That, to me, was very interesting. But one thing that I wanted to share was the experience itself that he had seemed to change him, as it does most of us. That was something that I really wanted to touch base on in his interview. I think that most of us have found very similar responses to how these things have affected our lives. So although most of you are familiar with Peter, I was interested to find out that he was also an experiencer. So I felt it was time to hear a side of him that most of you aren't familiar with. Peter was a very honest and a a very humble human being and I, I think that you'll really find that to be true in this interview so I hope you enjoy it uh, I had to wipe my brow <laughs> Reading your freaking bio, dude. I'm like, are you kidding me? Is this guy for real? Or is this just Actually, like a made when you up finish character? the bio, you can say, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. That's our time. See you next week. <laughs> um, and listen, as far as this goes, I want you to be completely comfortable um, asking me anything that you want. And think of it more, you know, as a conversation where you're asking the leading questions. Right. Um, but... As I think I mentioned to you, the one thing that I really um, have a problem with is when people out of respect or affection or wanting to be nice don't ask the questions that they really want to ask, right. uh, even if they feel that they might put me on a spot. Mm. Uh, I like being on a spot. Uh, it usually results in best answers. And I'm very good at saying, I don't know, unlike some <laughs> of my you colleagues. Should. Exactly. And, you know, that's the best answer. Yeah. Sometimes Especially it is. when we're talking about the subject. Uh, or, you know, specifics. Right. And, and a lot of people want to say that they know what's happening. But as much as we really get into this, um, we really learn that we really don't know more than we think we know. Yeah. Like I said in my, my talk in, in Portland, um, for me, I, I have um, – my heart is open to people who, especially experiencers and abductees, who will tell you tooth and verse of why they're here and how many groups are coming and all that. I find it incredibly irresponsible uh, in colleagues who are authors and researchers and investigators. And in fact, right now in uh, this new UK magazine – that um, I'm uh, writing for uh, called UFO Truth. And if you're not aware of it, Google it. Um, you can download the whole first issue for free. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's very much worth subscribing to. I just wanted to start off by saying that I know how extremely busy you are. And I feel quite honored that you would take the time out of your schedule to sit with me today. It means a lot. It really does. Well, it's my pleasure, Suzanne, and I figure uh, this is a very important part of what I do. And if I can't do this, then, you know, I shouldn't be doing this, so to say. Why are you doing this? Um, my reasons begin with 
honoring my sister's memory, basically, um, because she was so courageous and outspoken. And this goes back to the 1970s. Uh, we first spoke about um, the childhood UFO sighting we had in 1975. And that only because um, as somebody who had, I think, a very happy childhood, all things considered, uh, that memory was so upsetting to me because it it went against everything that I thought I knew as a kid. Um, I grew up at a time when the only contact I had with the subject was like Saturday afternoon going to the fantasy theater and seeing, you know, some great black and white B movie, uh, like the day the earth stood still or, um, invaders from Mars or, um, earth versus the flying saucers. And I simply intuited that the adult world did not take this seriously. And if they didn't, why should I? And then on this particular late morning in in June, uh, my sister and I were playing on the front lawn of our house. And it was just one of those days in this little village, as often happens in rural America, well, you know, where there was nothing going on. There were no other kids playing. The ice cream truck wasn't going by. The mailman wasn't. No cars that I remember. And I looked up and caught some movement. And um, I've explored this. I, I explored it three times in regressive hypnosis, partly to confirm the memories that emerged spontaneously on that afternoon for a number of reasons that I think I understand why. Certainly one of the most important being that I was ready to deal with it. Um, but also, uh, I had just made friends with Bud Hopkins, and this was about five years before he wrote his first book. He got interested about a year before me, and part of our friendship was based on that, um, our mutual love of art, and that we were both professional painters, uh, love of history, New York City literature, the news, whatever was going on. And I also had not even concern as much as curiosity about was I repressing more? Did this happen to me as well? And I did three different regressions over several years with three different hypnotherapists and absolutely nothing emerged in those that I didn't already remember except for one very small and very interesting detail. And also over the decades that followed working with Bud and spending time with hundreds of abductees and often being the first person they would speak to even before Bud when they'd call the office, I think if there was something lying dormant in me, it either would have rattled loose or... I couldn't do this work, I think, if this had happened to me. I think I would have just found it too upsetting. And I still feel that way to a degree. But um, I do it because I know it's important work. And I do it as a way of honoring my sister's memory. And um, because I'm pretty good at it at this point. Right. Um, I'm glad you brought her up because when I saw you at the Experiencers Speak 2 conference, which we just both presented at, which was – such an amazing experience. It was. I, I saw you in the parking lot when I arrived Two at the hotel. Two weeks ago. Two I weeks know. ago today. I know, exactly. And I just, I've had this in the back of my mind for the long, for ever since last year when we first met, when I started hearing you talking about your sister. And I didn't really know her story and your story with her. And it just piqued my curiosity because of what I'm doing, and, and that is trying to look at the the phenomenon from another the other side of the coin which is the side the side of the abductee or the experiencer not necessarily always looking at the shiny object in the sky yeah. but looking beyond that and i knew that you had had this experience but i never really heard you talk about it with her experience now that was a very interesting thing to share with somebody in your family that's not very common did she ever share with you what she saw and, oh, sure. And oh, what, sure. what did she have to say about it? The genesis of what happened was um, I was in my late 20s. I was um, in my loft in Chinatown. 
February is the Chinese New Year. And in the old days before Giuliani outlawed, well, firecrackers, fireworks were always illegal in New York. But very interestingly, uh, the city administration, while they cracked down on um, Italian kids selling firecrackers out of the trunks of their car on the 4th of July in Little Italy, they never hassled the Chinese and the Chinese-American community downtown where I lived. It has been ingrained for millennia to set off fireworks on the 4th of July. And I, I loved it in one way. But if you lived in Chinatown, it was like living in um, a demilitarized zone for several days and nights. And it was around the clock. I mean, I remember some of these kids tossing mats, as we used to call them, of firecrackers that were like 25 feet long over light poles and lighting them. And they go for 15 minutes. And you'd walk outside and you'd be kicking ankle deep through, um, you know, bits of blown up paper and smelling cordite instead of Chinese food. And I didn't sleep much for several days. I had also not long before done my first human potential workshop. And I went on to do quite a bit at that period of time, found them fascinating and then moved on to other things. So I was I had a head full of seeming revelations. I was sleep deprived. I think my cat had a nervous breakdown. It was just, you know, a lot of explosives. And sometime before this, I had had dinner with my grandmother. And she gave me something very special. Um, now, of course, I think it's fairly standard for parents to save every little scrap of paper that their little genius does and date them or, you know, whatever, and hold on to them as though they're extremely precious to the world as well as you. My folks didn't do that, but my grandmother did, and I drew a lot when I visited her and my grandfather in Manhattan. Um, I went on to a career as a painter, and one night when we were having dinner at her apartment on Lexington Avenue, she said, I have something for you. And she went into her closet and pulled out a portfolio of drawings that I had done from about five years old up until about 14, which was wonderful to see. Um, I remembered so much about each one of those drawings, the day, what I was thinking. And the last ones were done about the time that Helen and I had had this UFO sighting. And shortly after that, a girlfriend of mine um, did something wonderful. She borrowed them and returned them to me, each one encased in plastic. And I still have them. Um, I'd like to see those. And I was going through them. And... All I can tell you, because I've never had this experience before or since, is that like a freight train in my mind, these memories started to emerge. And it just kept running in my head like a, a film strip. And it was um, standing on the lawn with Helen and just catching this thing out of my peripheral vision and either saying Helen or look. And we watched as five silvery white disc-shaped objects against a clear blue sky. There was nothing ambiguous about this. Um, they seem metallic to us, but not like shiny stainless steel, like maybe brushed metal would be. And they were in a precise military V type formation. They all came in at the same speed as if they were one thing. And they stopped over the neighbor's house. And as we looked at them, could see little regular detailing around the edge. And this is what the memory is returning to me, uh, that you could only read that you'd read windows um, on a commercial airliner in the distance, except they were perfectly spherical. They were ellipses. You know, they weren't round. And I went through a reaction that I've since documented, I'm sure with several hundred people in many interviews, which I call the checklist reaction. <laughs> and you look at a phenomena and your mind rattles off everything that it isn't. These are not planes, blimps, Kites, balloons, helicopters, dirigibles, reflections from the ground, strange shaped clouds. And then you're just there. And we think it lasted for several minutes, which is forever. And we didn't say a word to each other. Helen was about six feet to my left. And at a certain point, I felt the most profound sense of loneliness I had ever felt. I felt completely disconnected from everything I had ever known. 
these were impossible, but there they were. Definitely no appendages of any sort. They were truly anomalous, and there was nothing ambiguous about them. And without saying anything to Helen, although she intuited it perfectly, I turned and went to run into our parents' house. Uh, my, our mother was making lunch for us at this time. It was about noon, a little bit earlier. And within a matter of seconds, I'll say two or three seconds, running across the front lawn, and I've revisited the house a number of times uh, the last years, most recently about two years ago. And, of course, everything seems so much smaller. But I remember as, running as fast as I could. And as I got to that point where the lawn stops and the front walk to the front door began, something happened to me that was so unlike anything I had ever experienced that I forgot about what we were just looking at. Now, that's pretty extreme. And this is also not uncommon. Um, I all of a sudden felt no fear. I was absolutely fascinated with what seemed to be going on with me. I think in reality, um, all of my motor coordination had stopped and I was going into a fall. But as far as I was concerned, whatever was happening was incredibly cool. And I had three conscious thoughts before everything went blue for a split second. And then everything went black. The first was how beautiful our mother's hydrangea bushes looked. She was a wonderful gardener, and they were very pale blue. The second was, and it's a standard boy kind of thing. I don't know if girls think like this. I'm coming into the sidewalk, which is coming up on me, you know, uh, like an aerial view as you're landing from a plane or something. And it's one of the long cracks in the sidewalk, and... The civilization of ants were very busy creating anthills and doing their thing and coming and going. And I observed that and I had a thought about when I was younger and hadn't worked through my insect karma yet and used to empty firecrackers into anthills and was a bug Nazi basically and vaporized them, <laughs> gave me a great sense of power. Until I was about eight years old and I had an epiphany and I realized what I was doing and I've always – been respectful of most insects ever since. Flies um, and uh, roaches are an exception, cultural, I guess. <laughs> and my third thought was, what a beautiful day it was. <laughs> and then, bang, I'm out. <laughs> okay. When this memory returned, I hoped that I had been out for a minute or two. Uh, I think it was considerably longer. And my first sensation as I opened my eyes was a throbbing in uh, my right forearm. I should also say here, people have different experiences of hypnosis. I waited until I was really ready. And the three different people that I worked with, one of them being Bud, the other, uh, a mentor of mine who is a tough, no-nonsense New York City police detective, trained in hypnosis for criminal investigation and a friend who had trained to do this work all said, you know, you went into alpha very deeply and I was there. I was 14 years old. I wasn't looking at myself at 14. I was 14. And the transcripts, the tape recordings, I'm using phrases and words that I hadn't used in decades. I'm, I'm wearing a polo shirt, which we used to call T-shirts. I'm wearing uh, my dungarees rather than my jeans. I'm wearing my keds. I can smell the grass. What had happened was I had obviously skidded into the sidewalk, and I had scraped the skin there. Now, again, a boy thought, I don't think girls think like this, was, and I hear myself saying it on the tape, wow, what a scab this is going to make. I mean, <laughs> red badge of courage and all. <laughs> My sister is not there. Um, I kind of reorient myself. I walk into the house as I had intended to do. And I walk up the stairs. Um, Helen and our younger sister, Anne, shared a room at the top of the stairs. Mine was off to the side. And I looked in her room, and there she was with her back to me, just looking out into the backyard. 
And I thought private moment, you know, I went downstairs to do what I was going to do. Went through the living room, through the dining room, and I stood at the kitchen door, and there was my mother straight ahead in right profile making lunch, maybe grilled cheese sandwich or something. She was working at the stove. And I said, Mom, Helen and I just saw some things in the sky that looked like those flying saucers in the movies. Now, many years later, when Helen and I sat down with our parents to discuss this with them for the first time, and I brought this up, my mom didn't remember. You know, it's just one thing kids say. But her intuition was so good. And I've spoken with so many people remembering a moment like this in childhood and so many parents remembering dealing with one of their kids or their kid at a moment like this. And often the reaction of the parent is dealing with their own anxiety and feeling protective toward their child was, oh, sweetie, you just thought that's what it was. But, you know, my mom just turned and she looked at me without any, you know, telling expressions except a serious one. And there were several minutes, several seconds of silence And she heard what I said and did not feel compelled to say something in response, which was just the right thing to say. Uh, I was a pretty good kid. I was a terrible liar. And I learned (laughs) it when I was five or six. So I really I I just didn't bother, you know, I much better to deal with whatever the punishment was going to be, which was never very draconian. The next thing I remember after lunch is getting on my Schwinn bicycle, which I wish I still had, um, and pedaling to our village library. And for the only time in my life, taking out two books on UFOs from a library. Like many people in the work, um, I have a big library of these things. And I all I wanted was to read some grown-up book that was going to tell me that this was something – that I could explain, understand in conventional terms. And I just, there were two books that said UFO on the spines, and there were quite a lot of UFO books in American libraries in the 60s. They tended to dump them at library sales in the 70s, just as a little postscript here, because of the ridicule factor. Libraries began to feel embarrassed. They had these books in their collections. And so if you're at the right place and the right time, you could pick up some classics for 35 cents or whatever. And I got them home and I went up to my bedroom and I closed the door and I flipped through them. And the first one was about how this guy had been picked up by Venusians and taken to Venus after a stop on the moon. (laughs) Eh, Wrong book. (laughs) The next one, which um, I actually remembered in hypnosis because it's a famous cover, is um, uh, George Ademski and Desmond Leslie's Flying Saucers from Mars. I would have brought them right back to the library, and I did the next day. I didn't want them in the house, but the day was getting late, and I waited. So now, jumping ahead, on this particular afternoon, this memory starts racing through my head, and I can't stop it. I'm sure I had never heard the term um, repressed memory. I don't know if it was used in the 70s, but I thought I was going crazy, and I really had a minor breakdown. I just started to sob. I knew that it had happened, but I couldn't understand how anyone could ever forget something like this. And I'm wrestling with these two kind of opposing thoughts, and I finally calm down, wash my face, blow my nose, have a cup of tea, and think out what I need to do. And there was only one thing to do, which was give Helen a call and find out if she shared the memory. And I also, in thinking it out, realized what I didn't want to do is just call her. And if she was around, just blurt out this memory and then have her say yes or no. I needed to hear it from her without predisposing her. At the time, my sister was an aspiring poet living in the Lower East Side. I lived about a mile or two south of her in East Chinatown. And I called her up, and she was free. I said, listen, I've had this memory come back from childhood, and I want to know if you remember the same thing I do. But, and I explained to her why I didn't want to say it, but I set the scene. I told her about when I thought it was, the time of day, what the weather was, 
where what we were doing, where we were standing. And at a certain point, she just stopped me mid-sentence and started to laugh and said, stop, I know what you're talking about. And then told me almost exactly what I just told you. Now, that caused a reaction for me that um, was very split. Literally, my thought was, oh, my God, they're real. Oh, my God, they're real. And then she said something I'll never forget. She said, but there's more and you're not going to like it. What? She said, well, I remember very well standing with you and we were just looking and looking and looking. And at a certain point, after a while, I remember you just kind of disappearing out of my right peripheral vision. And I assumed you were running into the house to tell mom, which I corroborated. And she said, then within two or three seconds, I saw the strangest thing. A blue beam of light shot out of one of these things. And I turned, it was coming right toward us. And I turned to look at you and you were in the light. And then the light went out and you fell down. Now, we were both very aware that you can't see a beam of light during the day. But that is what she saw. And in the first hypnotic regression, the one return memory was everything going blue before everything went black. Wow. And then she said, and I have other memories that I associate with that thing. And I said, what? Now, bear in mind here, I'm sure I must have heard about the Betty and Barney Hill case. It was so big culturally when it broke. I know I paid no attention to it. I remember in either the late 50s or early 60s, more likely, there were special issues of Life and Look magazine with UFO features as their cover story. Again, this was of no interest to me. I was the nerdiest nerd in Nerdville. <laughs> I was a short kid with glasses, living in books. I had no interest in sports. I drew, I painted, I collected stamps and coins and rocks and bugs. And at 14, I was still a Boy Scout and very proud of it, too. I could bake an apple pie in a hole in the ground on coals <laughs> covered over by branches and leaves. Cooking was my first merit badge. I still love it. <laughs> and you're darn proud of it. <laughs> I am. I am. As That's you should be. Easy thing. And <laughs> so I had never heard anything like this, where now it's the archetype of archetypes of certain abduction experiences. She remembered literally leaving the ground. And she was 12. She was just 12 with no fear. And just flying with her hair, which was fairly long at the time, blowing behind her. And the bottom of these things getting larger and larger and larger. Then she has a memory of a bunch of what she described as little doctors with big heads and big black eyes and one very tall one walking her through a metal hallway. And then she remembers being on the table with them all clustered around. And only talking to her in her head and saying archetypical things like, we've seen you before, we'll see you again, you're special, we love you, we won't hurt you. However, uh, one of Helen's great conflicting memories, and she had a lot of anger to work out on this, and it's so ironic that within months of very influential cultural force in pop music exploded in New York and London, and that was the so-called punk scene. And Helen was right there at the start. And um, within the next, uh, worked out a lot of it in terms of her act and wrote about it, never shied away from it in the music business press. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, my first thought as she told me this was very simply, oh, my God, my sister's gone crazy. <laughs> And then within a second or two, catching myself and saying, ah, four seconds ago, it was just fine that there were five friggin' flying saucers over the Parker's house where we could see the little windows. But now she's crazy. And my sister was, you know, we were as close as any brother and sister that I knew for really almost all of our lives. Um, in fact, as adults, we were adult roommates through two apartments and a house. Uh, we shared a tremendous amount of common interests as writers and artists, had many of the same friends. 
smoked about half of the marijuana in Mexico together, <laughs> love bad movies, love good movies, proofread each other's work, uh, and just had a lot of fun together. Um, and as she was telling me this, I realized that she was telling me the truth as best she knew it. And yet my mind was racing to find ways to uh, discount it, and I couldn't. And people talk about having something happen where their lives change overnight. I'd say my life changed completely in about 60 to 90 seconds. My only dream from the time I was about five years old was to be an artist. I knew what the word meant. And I knew there were certain grown-ups that did what I was doing as a little kid and then sold it. And unlike my dad who went to an office every day and other friends' dads who did what they did, that was how they made the money to do the things they did. And I thought, how do I get away with that kind of murder as an adult? I, I was a very gifted artist as a kid, and um, I studied painting and, and uh, design at the University of Bridgeport in Connecticut for two years. And then really at the most halcyon moment in the 60s, transferred to the School of Visual Arts in New York, and my life just exploded in the most exciting possible way. It was the place to be. There was no other place I would rather have been. And all of a sudden, I was surrounded by a lot of big fish from little ponds like me. All of us, you know, are the best drawer in our class. And all of us, with affection and respect overall, competing for future spots in immortality in the art world. And it wasn't like studying art anywhere else in the world. New York was and remains kind of the center of the commercial art world. So we were studying with the people to some degree whose works we were seeing in the Museum of Modern Art and going to the gallery shows of everybody who was major, going to the Met. I lived across the street from the Brooklyn Museum with a wonderful American collection. This was my life for a decade. And that day that Helen and I shared this, something happened that was really quite awful for me, which was something more important had insinuated itself in my life. And I resented it more than I can tell you, Suzanne. I continued to teach painting, which I was doing at the time at the School of Visual Arts. I continued to show my work for quite a number of years, but I was acting. And I, again, I really, there was a hole in my experience. Within a year or so, um, my library was filling up with UFO books. And at a certain point, I remember they supplanted the art books. I was always a big reader and I've always loved books. And my library has always been very important to me. And I built this part of my library at that time with a certain amount of pride and a certain amount of embarrassment. It estranged friends um, among my colleagues who saw me as a serious young artist. It weirded them out a bit. Um, the art dealer that I had hoped would become my dealer, who was just starting out, uh, Mary had been um, a uh, – started out as an accountant for a lot of famous artists and had a great head on her shoulders and went on to become – one of the most important, influential, and successful modern art dealers worldwide. And she had seen my work about a few months before this revelation. She came to my studio, and she liked it enough to schedule an appointment for half a year later. So a few months after this, she comes in, and my art has gone from a lot of sort of sophisticated esoteric imagery and a number of mediums a fragment of Mayan pottery, uh, a delicate line drawing of um, uh, the Pyramid of Cheops, um, uh, kind of an architectural drawing of um, Stonehenge as seen from above, below a Chinese silk image of Stalin with a big red line through it. I mean, I thought it was pretty deep. <laughs> but all of a sudden, I'm lost in the worlds of ovals and discs and flying saucers and... It really made her extremely uncomfortable. And I, re I was so lost in this at the time, it hadn't even occurred to me, frankly. And I was mortified. I realized I had just canceled my ticket with the real up-and-comer. And I knew I, I didn't want to put her on the spot of going through my little story. And, um, you know, we left 
with her cordial enough, but saying, whatever's going on with you, I hope you work it out, but um, I'm really not interested. It's almost as though the phenomenon alienated you from the Peter Robbins that you once knew artistically. That's right. And and just basically abducted you into something completely different. I had to understand what had happened to my sister and what we saw. Right. And so it affected... Still, I'm still working on it. Uh, well, I, you know, I think that we all are. We're all trying, <laughs> trying to figure out yeah. what the heck is really going on. But something that, that seems a common theme here, and correct me if I'm wrong... I, I seem to find that a lot of people that I've spoken to who have had this experience, whether it be um, having a visitation or, or seeing something in the sky or having direct contact or, or uh, an abduction. I hate actually using the word abduction anymore. It's, it seems quite archaic because I think the, the phenomenon is changing in a lot of ways. But it seems that a lot of experiencers are artists in some way, shape or form. And either directly as a response to the experience that they went through, trying to describe it in a way that they can only do other than words, because it's such a difficult thing to explain to somebody um, verbally. But I think drawing pictures and, and also being a songwriter, I, I feel there are a lot of musicians as well who are yeah. contactees. And I Absolutely. know that you know this as well, because I know that you love music. And I've I've read some things about you in the past um, on social media, little comments here and there about certain bands. And I thought, I've got to talk to Peter about music because I, I feel very strongly that there are these, I'm going to say esoteric, uh, quote unquote, I don't want to use the term, but I will, star seeds uh, in the music business who see things in a totally different light. And the way that they describe these things in their music is just, quote-unquote, out of this world. Um, how do you feel about that? Well, um, I should say, especially in the years I worked with Bud, many, many people came to him who were not in the arts, not even remotely. Lawyers, police officers, um, office workers, factory workers, um, people doing everything other than creative work. However, there was always a respectable component of creative artists in one way or another, uh, maybe more than, you know, uh, a mechanical demographic might suggest. Helen, um, one of the things that affected her tremendously and that she was really resentful of and angry toward was at a certain point hearing in her head when she was on the table, we love you, we won't hurt you, when they were hurting her. And that made me angry. You know, um, years later in therapy, and I should say here, before we go back to the artist aspect, within a year I learned that um, there was a legendary therapist working in New York and out of his office in Red Bank, New Jersey, who had been the first assistant for the last 11 years of his life to legendary Dr. Wilhelm Reich. I was introduced to Reich's work as a teenager, and it's had a tremendous impact on my life. But even when I was reading his work, the least interesting part of it was in the early 1950s, using um, a device, a remarkable device that he created for weather modification in field tests in Maine and in Arizona, it attracted the um, activity of UFOs in the area. And that's not a deduction that he and his colleagues arrived at lightly. It happened repeatedly when they used the cloud buster and not when they didn't. And when I learned that Dr. Baker was still alive, practicing, certainly well in his 70s at the time, I wanted to meet him because in my conscious mind, I just wanted to meet this guy who in my mind was very famous and worthy of tremendous respect. I had let her, read a lot of his articles over the years in the journals dealing with this subject. And it took me six weeks to get an appointment with him. And I had put together a little folder of information on UFOs, I was, in my mind, quite experienced at the time. I had been involved for about a year or so. And also a number of declassified documents I thought would interest him. And to cut to the chase, I went in, 
And I presented them to them, him and gave him a little talk. And he said, why are you here? And my thought was, I thought I just told you. And what I then told him was that since Helen and I had discussed this from the day, I felt very split off from the world. Um, the closest, very dramatically split off. I, I felt I was walking around with this huge secret in my head that I couldn't talk to most people about because of fear of being judged or ridiculed or what have you. And I often, being um, a, a passionate film lover from the time I was little, I saw it filmatically as a split screen in my head. I'd be walking down East 23rd Street, coming from my teaching job, um, and at the same time, I was Kevin McCarthy at the end of the Invasion of the Body Snatchers, <laughs> where he's standing out in that highway in California screaming at drivers, they're here, they're here already, you're next, you're next. And Baker understood it and reminded me at one point that he had had two UFO sightings, one with Reich in Maine and another of several orange disc-shaped objects over his area in New Jersey. And over the years that... Um, I was in therapy with him, I was really not only able to normalize this as just the way it is, and yeah, the world doesn't recognize it as serious, that's understandable, but it's real. But he was very encouraging to me in moving forward in doing this work more and more professionally. And here I am all these years later, in a week and a half, I leave for Rome to give three papers on Reich and UFOs at an international scientific conference on his discoveries. I'm really excited about that. And to go back to Helen, though, um, again, this whole punk thing was exploding. She's living in the East Village. And her boyfriend at the time was a drummer in a relatively unknown band that went on to become a world-famous heavy metal band, the Blue Oyster Cult. And he took a couple of her poems, and he put them to music, and they put them on the next album to come up just one of these crazy dreams where one week she was unbelievably struggling and the next week you know these out this album went gold and then platinum and she started to have a respectable income from royalties on these songs and continued to write for them and for the next decade um, performed under the stage name of Helen Wheels and the Helen Wheels band but my musical background and love is extremely eclectic I remember kind of as a little kid when rock and roll kicked in with people like Elvis and Jerry Lee Lewis, and I liked it. But I also liked symphonic works. I still love Mozart, Beethoven, all of the classics. I was not only in my junior high school and high school chorus, I was the president of the chorus of more than 100 singers as a senior. And, you know, in every school musical, I love Gilbert and Sullivan. I still do. Uh, I love modern jazz. I, I had a, a very broad-based love of uh, an appreciation for a lot of different kinds of music, but I had only been hearing some of these songs occasionally on the radio, and I just didn't get it until she started dragging me to CBGB's, and that is really where it all began. And I knew Patti Smith going back to the late 60s when she was um, – a very shy book clerk and poet um, working at uh, then a legendary bookstore on West 47th Street called the Gotham Book Mart. She was also the girlfriend of the drummer um, who went on to be the legendary drummer for the Blue Oyster Cult, who unfortunately passed a few months ago, uh, Alan Lanier, very talented musician. And she exploded on that stage, and along with her, um, the Ramones, who I thought were a joke at first, <laughs> I thought they were hysterically funny. And they were wonderful performers, and I really liked their music. They had gotten the entire whole essence of rock and roll down to X number of beats in like two and a half minutes, and the lyrics to their songs were hysterical. I loved the um, kind of over-the-top vaudeville and vamping that went along with performers like Iggy and the Talking Heads and uh, Richard Hell and the Voidoids and um, 
a, a favorite group whose name I actually can't say, <laughs> uh, the Dead Kennedys, right. and on and on. And I just became a fan and worked with my sister for years in different capacities with her band as well as doing my own stuff and still have a great deal of high regard for some of the terrific musicians who came up uh, through the ranks there. Um, and Helen really was able to externalize a lot of her angst about the subject. We did a number of television shows together over those years, sometimes with Bud, uh, sometimes on our own with other people. She was uh, very outspoken, even in interviews in the music business press about her experiences and saw part of her role as an educator. The subject overtly came up sometimes in her lyrics and in uh, an extended play album that she uh, put out um, with the graphics on the back. She's also quite a pioneer in that the one major record that she put out um, had some inserts besides the lyrics. Um, it had copies of some classic declassified United States documents relative to UFOs um, stuck there in there with the record, which I thought was extremely cool, of course. And... Um, Helen was a very multidimensional person. Um, I, I think for a lot of artists, as they create their alter egos or personas, they're very protective of their real identities. They don't want you to know other things about them, you know, as though they had just grown up into that persona. Helen had a degree in English literature. She was a, an extremely good tailor who made all of her own costumes. She was a graduate of the French Fashion Institute. Uh, a first-rate cook, an almost professional-level herpetologist, uh, specialist in reptile studies, extremely well-read, um, liked a lot of other kinds of music, too, very culturally aware, and um, went on to um, deal with, I mean, her performances were so over-the-top and so physical that she started to suffer the equivalent of, like, sports injuries, and before there were mosh pits, she would throw herself out into that audience and knock over tables and first kill as many people as possible with her twenty two <laughs> caliber blank guns in such classic songs uh, as um, um, Gray Matter in the Streets of Dallas about the Kennedy assassination and other cheerful ditties like that. Oh, my God. And went on to become a ranking female bodybuilder and nutritionist and one of the – the jobs that she was working um, when she died was um, she was a trainer at a local gym as well as continuing her music work and writing. And she was, I think, a much better writer than I am and a much more prolific one. Uh, I still have hundreds of pages that I've only gone through cursorily of poetry, short stories. Um, she left an unpublished memoir, which I hope will have out in the next year or two. And uh, pack more into 50 years than most people do into 100. So I'm so sorry to hear about her passing. Mm. Um, I know that must have just been devastating as close as you were. And yeah. it's yeah. wonderful that you can carry on her legacy and hopefully getting these things published. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. I yep. really look forward to reading all about her life. She sounds like a fascinating woman. Yes, indeed. If you Google um, her, um, it will take you to uh, a number of information sources, and that's under her performing name of Helen Wheels. So is that Helen, proper um, spelling, and then just Wheels? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And some people thought it was uh, had something to do with the famous uh, Paul McCartney song, Hell on Wheels. Right. Which actually was what the name was about uh, for her. Uh, but she was named by a wonderful... Uh, um, musician who's still a good friend, uh, uh, Handsome Dick Manitoba, the lead, lead singer of the Great Dictators. Wow. Uh, one of the ultimate punk groups. Um, and she was hell on wheels at times. And um, we had a lot of fun with that, I must say. But um, there is a memorial website that uh, an old friend of hers set up after she passed which is simply HelenWheels.com. But you can find um, uh, performance clips and a lot more information uh, about her online. Great. So, Peter, 
you're going to Rome. Mm. And I know there's a lot of implications about the Vatican. And I know that you're presenting the, these papers on Wilhelm Reich. And it's that was a huge read for me, by the way. <laughs> and it was it really something to wrap your head around. It's something that I had never known about. So yeah. thank you for sharing that. Uh, it's, it's very informative. Is there anywhere that anyone can read uh, what you've written online? Uh, my website is down now. I'm hoping it'll be up and running by the end of the year again. But um, actually, what you can do is go to YouTube and type in my name and Wilhelm Reich. I've lectured on Reich and UFOs and Reich, aside from UFOs, on and off for many years. In fact, uh, it was the subject of the very first talk um, I gave uh, more years ago than I like to remember. And I know some of those talks are on YouTube, either complete or in clips. Some of the papers that I've published on them over the years will be available hopefully next year uh, sometime in a, uh, a book, which will be a compilation of a lot of my writing. Perfect. And obviously, the one thing that most people know you for is uh, Let the Gate, which mm-hmm. was one of the most prolific uh experiences um, with somebody in the military, I think, ever recorded. And yes. what led you to become fascinated with that subject in mm. wanting to write a book about it? Yeah. Well, you're, of course, referring to um, the book that I wrote with my co-author, Larry Warren, yes. which was originally published um, back in 1997 and then republished in an expanded edition on the 25th anniversary of the events in question in 2005. Um, it addresses um, the so-called Rendlesham Forest UFO incident, alternately known as the Bentwaters incident, which is now long regarded as the best known and the best documented UFO incident in the history of Great Britain. And the story broke 30 years ago last month. I'm I'm sorry, next month, this coming month. And you'll see a flurry of... uh, references to that coming up in the next weeks. The Rendlesham Forest incident occurred in late December 1980 over three consecutive nights and involved a real myriad of UFO events and incidents in the Rendlesham Forest in the southeastern part of England um, in an area called Suffolk, East Anglia, and also in and around two very highly secured NATO bases. One RAF Bentwaters, uh, maintained by the United States Air Force since uh, World War II, and the other RAF Woodbridge, which at the time of the events was primarily uh, Royal Air Force and British military with a modicum of American presence. Anyway, like a lot of people in the field, and at that point um, I had been involved in UFO studies for some years, I became aware of it after it broke in England. And it only came out into the public realm for one reason, namely one of the men involved who had left the service with an honorable discharge after and a massive case of post-traumatic stress, as a number of the other witnesses still have, sad to say, could not adjust to this or keeping the secret. And in 82, seeked out a then um, fairly well-known UFO investigator named Larry Fawcett. Larry also had the distinction of being a uh, police lieutenant in Coventry, Connecticut, and a professional investigator. And Larry basically told Larry pretty much, well, a tremendous amount of what he remembered. Locations, names, approximate dates, the level of involvement. In so many words, he outed everybody who he was aware of which led to um, decades of a certain level of resentment, which we're still dealing with right now. And the information that he gave Fawcett was put into the form of a Freedom of Information Act. And not long after, it resulted in the release of the only document at that time ever to confirm it, which was a uh, rather cursory one-page memorandum written by the then deputy base commander about three weeks after the event. It compressed the event. It deleted a lot of detail. It 
redacted certain things, but it confirmed its reality. And the story literally exploded in Great Britain. Larry had been told that he should have a pseudonym when it broke to protect him. Uh, I think, and he agrees certainly, that it was more dramatic device to add drama to the story. And the following year, in 1983, he came out under his own name, where he has been ever since and in no uncertain terms. Also in 1983-84, um, the so-called Westchester UFO sightings were rampant, and that's uh, a county uh, just north of New York City. And this is mostly huge triangular shaped craft, but this was at the beginning of the video revolution and a lot of people were filming it and it got to the point where there was a huge day long town meeting at the local high school and boy, that audience was packed. Um, it was the one time I met Dr. Alan Hynek. Right. Uh, Bud was there um, and so many local people giving their impassioned talks up on that stage, some of them showing footage. Anyway, there was a break at a certain point and I went out for smoke and I saw kind of a knot of people and kind of walked over to see what was going on. And in the middle of them was this young guy answering questions about this event. And I thought, wow, I'll bet that's the guy. And he seemed to be doing his best to answer questions as well as he could. And at a certain point, the break was over and people started heading in. And I can't really explain this except to say it's just the way it happened. I waited till everybody else was gone. And I went up to him and I looked at him and he looked at me and I said, good luck. <laughs> and he said, thank you. And we shook hands. And that was that. Four years later, uh, he was a featured speaker at a very important MUFON conference. 1987 was the 40th anniversary of Roswell and the Kenneth Arnold sightings. And it was in Washington, D.C. at American University. I was also um, uh, on a part of a panel discussion on abductions, uh, chaired by, uh, moderated by Dr. David Jacobs. And um, dear Debbie Jordan, who you met two weeks ago, uh, Debbie Jordan Campbell of um, Bud Hopkins' book Intruders was there. Whitley Strieber was there, although, um, yeah, his book had just come out. Um, right. Literally just come out and a number of other luminaries in the field. And I was there on that panel as the non-abductee representing people who grew up with an abductee in the family. I heard Larry speak. He heard me speak. We both got different agendas into our heads. And the next day we ran into each other in the hallway. I think fully authentic military witnesses to UFO incidents who are willing to put themselves on the line are extremely rare, likely rarer than the full number of those who have come forward who may have had some peripheral information or what have you, but may not have been as fully involved as they claim. Even just hearing him speak on that stage, he struck me as the angriest person I had ever met. And as I got to know him better, I feel that was accurate, certainly back then, and the most obsessed. Mm. He wanted to know what happened to him when he was an airman first class and a security cop in the United States Air Force back in 1980. Right. And he, I wanted to do a really extensive interview with him, and he wanted to write a book with me. And I told him what I was after, and he didn't tell me what he was after. And he said, when do you want to do the interview? Um, I said, when are you available? He said, next weekend. And the following Friday, he came down to my apartment on East 46th Street around the corner from the UN, uh, slept on the couch, and we must have recorded six or seven hours. Wow. It was the greatest interview I had ever done. And when we were done, he gave me permission to use it in any way that I wanted. He wanted nothing from it. He had put a few things on the record that he had not earlier. And I asked him why. I was a stranger. And he said, because after hearing you speak, I know you're the right person to write a book with me about what happened to me and about the incident. And my first thought was I was very flattered. But I asked him why he wasn't going after somebody who was like a published author and had written a book. And he said, no, I think you're it. Um, 
you express yourself really well. The way that you talked about your sister's experience makes me know this is personal. And um, my offer to you is really simple. As long as I get to tell my story in my own terms, you are free to prove me truthful or to prove me a liar. Uh, If you want to go after, you know, showing me up and, you know, if you can establish that I'm not telling the truth or a wannabe or, you know, brainwashed or whatever, it'll be kind of a split book, but I'm willing to risk that. Um, I will give you access to every part of my life. I'll give you every piece of military um, documentation I have on myself, everything that's been written on the case so far. We'll write it, and whatever we make on it will split. And I have to tell you, Suzanne, at that point in my life, I had written, had published a number of articles. I had given a number of talks. I was into it, and I was looking for a book-length project, and I thought, this is it. This is great. And we shook hands in my living room. And I have to tell you, I had no idea of what I was getting myself into. (laughs) None at all. I thought maybe we'd spend a a couple of thousand dollars. We'd spend a year or two. Maybe we'd go to England once. The book would come out. Obviously, it would be a huge success. There'd be a movie made with big stars playing us. And we would spend the rest of our adult lives endorsing checks and, you know, just dealing with the women who wanted to be with us. But it didn't work out like that. And Larry went bankrupt. Um, I drained my 401k, my life savings, started to sell things. I became as obsessed as him uh, for all the right reasons. I became very paranoid for um, a period of time. Now we, of course, it's common knowledge that the NSA listens to everybody's communications. Back then, to learn that the NSA was interested in you was very frightening. And um, it destabilized me to a degree, and I cut off a lot of my communications with people I care about and um, was quite reclusive for about a year until I just got tired of living in fear and angrier and angrier at what had been done to Larry and a number of the other young men who had been involved. They had been put through the ringer by a branch of American intelligence that we have identified as a field arm of the NSA. Absolutely treated contemptibly for guys, in one case a woman, who had joined the service for all the right reasons. And I was propelled for the following years, not so much by a fascination with the other intelligences behind this very real series of events, but my anger. And that's not a bad thing. Um, I was able to um, work it through very well. And We calculate that we spent between us well over $100,000 with Larry spending the larger amount and neither one of us very well fixed to start with. But we had help as we moved forward when we needed it. My dear sister paid a lot of my bills for years so that we could finish it and we will always be indebted to her for that. Right. Stevie Ray Vaughan uh, helped us finish the book. Wow. Months before he was killed, much too soon. And what I just love his music still, and yeah. especially so. Absolutely. He was friends with Larry, and he had sent him a round trip ticket to where he lived in Texas, and used to joke with Larry about when you and Pete going to finish the book. I need something new to read on the road, and Larry had to admit to him that um, we had run out of money, and he said, "Why didn't you tell me?" And he disappeared and came back. A few minutes later, Larry said, with a couple of guitars and vests and a hat and some other things, he signed them all, said, sell these and get back to work. And we did. And then he died. Wow. I wanted to touch on something that you were were talking about with Larry, um, with the anger that's involved in, you know, obviously with the government and and people in the military that have experienced things, pi- you know, commercial pilots, private pilots, mm-hmm. people having the fear of coming forward with things that they've seen um, or things that have happened to them. And that's one of the reasons why I started doing this, uh, speaking publicly about it. And mm-hmm. I realized for myself that I wanted to let go of the fear of the things that had happened as well. And I know I can vouch for thousands upon thousands of other people 
normal people, everyday people, you know, doctors, lawyers, butchers, what have you, yep. that have had this experience. And that's why I'm so proud of Starburn Support and the Experiencers Speak conference, that these normal, everyday people can stand up and have a voice, have a platform, and share the things that they need to share to live a normal life. I mean, if we didn't have these outlets, I think we would all go crazy. And, you know, I know that you uh, feel very strongly about the phenomenon itself uh, in every capacity. But I just want to say that I, I am so proud that you embrace the other side of the coin, that being the uh, quote-unquote uh, abduction phenomenon being as uh, you might have been a, um, obviously directly that it affected you personally and your sister. Mm. And I think because of that, uh, it's left a mark on you in, in a way where yes. you almost feel that you did have that sense of losing control of you, of Peter Robbins in that moment and your sister, Helen. And trying to get some of that back is, is part of the journey. And it's, it's somehow unreachable and untouchable to be able to get that back. But maybe the, there is a lesson in all of this. And maybe we need to stop thinking so much about it and overanalyzing or, or trying to capitalize on it. You know, obviously, we both know that there is no money to be made in ufology. And you obviously uh, experience that. Trying well, it's to very do rare. It it's is very, very rare. rare. And, and if you do, you know, good for you. Obviously, we yes. need to get these things out there mm -hmm. in any way we can. And sometimes we need the funds to do that. I was looking at the Experiencer Speak uh, room and all the presenters, and I felt very compelled to say this, and I think I'll say it now, mm. that we're not celebrities. We're no different than anyone else. Mm -hmm. And nobody's looking for notoriety or fame. We don't want to be singled out as better than the person sitting in the audience listening to you. We're all the same. And I think it's very important to remember that, that we're all in this together by doing these things and joining hands and, and speaking about these things publicly. I agree with you with the understanding that there are people, maybe we'll call them exceptions to the rule, who are in it for notoriety. And no names, but I've observed this as a fact. I think it's human nature that you're going to encounter this in almost any area. And I also think that it's very possible to get your life back, so to say. Uh, for me, the thankless almost decade that Larry and I spent increasingly to the exclusion of everything else, I think about what I could have done with that almost 10 years of my life, and then going from, you know, being a semi-known person in this work to having a major bestseller in the United Kingdom and being plastered all over television there and doing more BBC radio interviews than we can remember. And I, I think I've been back there now almost 25 times, and I thought we'd just be going once. The area where it happened has become a second home for me. And one of the tremendous benefits of having put ourselves on the line for so long is the incredible friendships that we have developed with so many people here in Europe and to a degree all around the world. Also, the fact that we accomplished something which both of us acknowledge was near impossible given the tensions that erupted over the course of the time that we worked together were extremely different personalities. Completing a book like this was one thing. Getting it published was another thing. Getting it into print, yet another. And yet we did it. And the experience, for example, of doing a 15-city month-long speaking tour in the United Kingdom was beyond belief. Um, then over the years, more and more people they continue to contact me on a weekly basis, telling me the impact that our book has had on them and thanking us for our good work. And every once in a while, learning that somebody in public life that you admire tremendously is read your book or even somebody who's a fan of yours. Gosh, about 10 years ago, Paul McCartney read our book and that blew both of our minds. Larry met with him 
in Liverpool. And I remember um, the next year returning to Suffolk on the 25th anniversary in 2005, this time with my, enfi- my entire family. And we stayed for a week in the home of the dear family, who I think of as family, who put Larry and I up year after year in their wonderful bed and breakfast and had Christmas with them. And that Christmas, I gave my brother-in-law a box set of some of Paul McCartney's songs inscribed to my brother-in-law from him. That was wonderful. And Anyway, a lot of music business people, a lot of artists um, have enriched our lives and just so many regular folks. But you can get your your life back. And I think if you dedicate yourself to anything that you feel is important enough, you can own what you feel might have been taken away from you. And I don't mean to sound, you know, like a negativist relative to this phenomena. I've met, obviously, many people that have had very positive experiences or realized positive benefits, including people that had negative experiences. Just getting through a trauma is a triumph. And although I considered Bud Hopkins one of my dearest friends, and he was a mentor of mine, and I worked for him on and off for 20 years plus, I considered John Mack a dear friend and colleague, knew him from almost the very beginning of the time that he became involved in the work. And we had many wonderful conversations, agreed to disagree on certain things. We also had a lot of fun together. And I happened to be in England, not that far away from where he was killed by that drunken driver when it happened. And um, knew immediately that many people who were not paranoid might think that he was murdered and took it upon myself to do my own in-depth investigation into everything surrounding his death, including reading through the court records, etc. And as people have occasionally said to me in so many words, in a context that I resent tremendously relative to the assassination of President Kennedy, hard to believe 50 years ago uh, coming up, um, that when an important great person dies suddenly and under circumstances that are open to question, we have a need to ascribe meaning to that death, we can't have it be pointless, you know, just one crazy lone gunman. In the case of Kennedy, he was murdered, and it was by more than one person. Right. In the case of John Mack, he was killed by a drunken driver who had his was on his fifth license suspension, was incredibly drunk, and even if he had been totally Manchurian candidated out with a three-man intelligence military team on the roofs, you know, with their headsets on and, you know, very powerful, accurate rifles, what have you. If they had said, you know, gun, you know, your um, gas pedal right now, it would have been impossible to execute, especially with the amount of alcohol this guy had in his system. You know, that's how we lost John. Right. Uh, But I feel very fortunate and really blessed that I had a chance to not only know him, but to proofread the manuscript for his book abduction and find (laughs) one very critical error, which he was so relieved that I had found it, that he inscribed my copy of the book um, to Peter, our number one sleuth. And don't think I haven't played on that occasionally, (laughs) but he was a sweet, wonderful guy. And I think the highest level of dialogue ever recorded on the so-called abduction experience or phenomena was an evening with John and Bud. I think it was at uh, Nathaniel Hall in Boston. I think it is recorded and available, maybe on YouTube, I don't know. I think you're right. But these were two of the smartest, most insightful men I have ever met, both driven um, by a desire to know more about this mystery both coming from different points of view and absolutely adored each other. Personally, we're very close friends whose interests in the subject manifested themselves in different ways. But um, I miss them both very much. And um, another reason that I and other people continue in this work is to, you know, just try to even come close to maintaining the level that those two set for inquiries into this 
most fascinating of all mysteries. Well, well, you're definitely doing a great job. I wanted to ask you a question uh, in regards to the statement that I had said that, that you reiterated down is um, about getting your life back. And what I was thinking more along the lines of is trying to get that missing time back. And, and that being said, a lot is being said about having hypnotic regression. And do you recommend it for people who have had these experiences? And I myself have not mm-hmm. for my own personal reasons. Sure. But maybe I'm maybe not thinking about this for the right reasons, because I do have a lot of things that are seem to be unresolved about my life. But I have this huge just got this feeling in my stomach that I'm not supposed to do this. Suzanne, I think that's an incredibly important question. I'm glad you asked it. I witnessed, have witnessed more hypnotic regressions of individuals that have had variations on these experiences than I can actually remember. And I've spent time with in the hundreds of them over the decades that I am convinced are absolutely authentic. There is no one answer for this. The first question that I pose for anybody that asks me, as you have, is bearing in mind that if you follow this direction and you decide to explore this with a responsible, well-trained, qualified hypnotherapist or, you know, mental health professional that is trained to be a hypnotist, whatever, Are you prepared to deal with learning things that may be emotionally destabilizing, frightening, shocking? Or is it okay with you to understand that things like this have very likely happened to you or have have happened to you and that you have partial memories? But the big question is, how is your life? How are you doing? Mm -hmm. Um, Are you pretty happy, um, generally speaking? Um, Do you have friends that you love who love you? Are you in a core relationship where you feel supported by your partner and you support them? Do you like what you do for a living? Again, being aware that the truth doesn't necessarily set us free, at least immediately. Um, It may give you more than you want. However, if you have reached a point in your life and never, ever, ever to anyone that is looking at this possibility, would I say even consider allowing yourself to be pushed or pressured by anyone ever. If you, if your spirit of inquiry is at the level where you're willing to do this and you know, you know, if you go through something scary, it's hypnosis. It's not really happening. Um, Good practitioners will give you ways to deal with this in the moment, and you can be brought out of it either remembering just what, you know, um, you want them to have you remember and deal with it as you um, choose. If you feel that it's right for you and that your desire to learn more about or simply to confirm what you remember. Part of the myth is that people walk around with these, you know, unusual anxieties and just say, gee, maybe I was abducted by aliens. And then they go to somebody who, for some weird reason, believes such nonsense is true, gets them under and to satisfy their own twisted picture of reality, convinces them that they were abducted by aliens. I mean, I've actually heard people accuse people like John and Bud and Dave and other people of this. Or that mm, the memories that you don't have that may be sitting there waiting to be relived are ones that you are now ready to deal with. When New York City Police Detective Sergeant Pete Mazzola offered to regress me and my sister, we both waited different amounts of time until we were ready and then took up that offer and then Both of us, uh, Helen worked with Bud. Um, He hypnotized me, and again, I did an independent one. I was good and ready when I did it. And in my case, my memories were so complete that 
only one extra detail kicked in. And in my sister's case, she never forgot it. And that was something that she stressed the first day that we talked about this, which bears on a very important question. Um, at a certain point, I said, how come we've never talked about this? So almost 14 years. And she said it was really simple. Do you remember that afternoon I asked you if you wanted to talk about it and you said no? You know, you're my brother. I love you. I respect you. Um, I honored that request and the day led to the next week, to the next month, to the next year. And then the years started to pass. And that's why we never talked about it. However, she told me not only had she never forgotten about it, she thought about it on a very regular basis for all those intervening years. And rather than have those memories frighten her, she said, I just would always think that I was special. And God knows she was. And that the, having that experience and several others that she was able to recall in part, in that sense, were positive for her. Uh, Helen was a member of, uh, along with um, um, Debbie Jordan Cabell, of Bud's original support groups. And for me, the most wonderful thing um, about being always um, the privileged fly on the wall, the person in the room along with Bud who had not had these experiences, was, I guess, the essence of any good, well-run support group, which is you are in 110% safe space with a group leader who is the right temperament and or, well, and training, who honors the fact that these things really happen. And as you come out of yourself and you begin to discuss with other people in the room with very different backgrounds and life experiences than yours other than this, my God, it's happened to them too. That's what they said to me. I had that same feeling at that point. I remember that same memory that they have. And realizing you're not going crazy, you know, this isn't the weirdest thing in the world. It happens to more people than almost any of us even want to contemplate. That much I will say about the statistics. It's probably mind-blowing if we could ever know it, and we never will. And for me, one of the great, great moments of all those years of working with Bud was after several years of my sister saying, you know, I love you all. This has been an amazing experience. It's helped me get myself to the point that I wanted to be. And um, I'll be in touch with you all, you know, personally to one degree or another, but um, I'm out of here. Um, a support group like therapy is not meant to become a lifestyle. Right. You use it until you don't need to anymore. And you take some of those friendships with you. Other ones you leave behind and you get on with the business of living again. For me, that is as miraculous and as transcendent as any more ethereal, esoteric, new agey communication from these other intelligences can be. Well, that's very good advice. I guess for me, the things that I want to remember uh, are some messages that were given to me that I remember, but only part of. Uh huh. And, you know, it's just, I think, more curiosity. I know that I can't tailor make what is is gained from, from mm -hmm. the actual uh, session itself because... You can't say, oh, I don't remember that, but I want to remember this. You know what I'm That's saying? Right. It's, it's not tailor-made. No. It's all, it all comes out. And so I basically have to tell myself that I am going to get some bad with the good. Well, you need to reflect on that. Um, I know, you know, you have an amazing husband and a great daughter and so many dear friends that love you. You've got a really good support system in place, and now all the more so um, working with the groups. I would say to bear in mind that regressive hypnosis is different for different people. One of the wonders for me was the extraordinary detail that you can extract from it. At that moment where I was undergoing regression, and it was either with Bud or Pete, where I'm standing in the kitchen doorway talking to my mom. And, you know, the the person working with me said, what time is it? And I said, I don't know. Mm. And they said, is there a clock in the room? I said, yes. They said, where is it? I said, on the kitchen wall up to the right of my mom. 
they said, look at the clock and tell me what time it is. I looked at the clock and I said, 20 after 12. You just gave me the chills. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> it was great. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> it, it's awesome. It really wow. is awesome. And I've witnessed the same thing where I've also witnessed people who even years later, and a good example are two of the other Rendlesham Forest witnesses who are now having their story written for a book that should be published, I believe, in the first quarter or so of next year, being written certainly primarily by Nick Pope, who still, I've seen clips which they've been very courageous to allow into the public realm of them under hypnosis, and they are extremely frightened, even decades later, of whatever it is that they're frightened about, and will not go through that allegorical door to see what it is, which is tragic. And it's just part of the dynamic of um, the trauma that in some cases stays, you know, with you. Um, Yeah, and it's weird, too, because I, when you think about when you say trauma, what we would consider traumatizing to them might seem normal. So it's just our interpretation of the situation that makes it traumatic. Yeah. And if you can get beyond that aspect of it, maybe you can look at it from a different aspect and say, well, wait a minute, this had to be this way because of this. And there's a reason why these things are happening. I really, truly believe that. Yeah, I I mentioned in the the talk that I gave at the Experience Your Speak conference that there is a misnomer that if you have had overall not pleasant experiences, that you tend to look down or have a jaundiced view of people who have had transcendent, if not a positive experience, a positive result from the experience in your life. And people whose sight that their contacts have been filled with goodness and light and elevating, you know, them as human beings and in a spiritual way, um, feel that Folks who have had a rough time of it are vibrating at too low a frequency or come from negativism and fear rather than love. I I think this is really unfair on both sides. I have come to feel because it's not something you can come to know because it is unknowable that there are quite a number of other intelligences who come and go with impunity from our planet, our dimension. And their motivations, their goals, their relationships with humanity may vary broadly uh, from the truly positive and those intelligences that really want us to elevate our consciousness and stop doing what is the favorite activity of man for millennia drawing a line in the dirt and then killing each other if right. somebody goes over the line in the dirt. And I say man as opposed to mankind because this is not something women came up with. Um, <laughs> I have the, o- no, the <laughs> other thing is to respect the fact that we may never have the answers that we seek and that that's not a bad thing. Life is woven out of a tapestry of the known and the unknown. And I think mysteries are a wonderful part of life and not necessarily ones that are solved in the last few pages of the book. I also feel that we can do our best to assist ourselves and educate others by being honest about what's happened to us to the degree that we feel comfortable. And that may mean, you know, a few years ago, there was a tiny little circle of people around you. Maybe it was just your husband or your husband and a best friend or something who knew that you would have the experiences you've had. You have, you know, in the contemporary way of saying it, you have outed yourself. You know, anybody in the world can now go on YouTube and hear you talk about your experiences. Your experiences are in the slow spiral of going viral. And that's a wonderful thing. You've given a gift to a lot of other people. I think also every time someone comes forward to say, I had a sighting and it wasn't any aircraft or airplane and I'm so tired of people thinking that UFOs is a silly subject or I was taken and I was returned and this really happens to real people. If you have a problem with that, you know what? 
I absolutely understand it and I appreciate it. And if it hadn't happened to me, I might be the one, you know, trying to repress a smile and a raised eyebrow Mm. and a wink and a nudge because behind that sarcasm or that condescension is anxiety. And behind that anxiety may be some very real fear. Right. And behind that is absolute terror of the unknown. So if you want to poke a little fun at me, God bless you. I know, right? You know, yeah. and, you know, just don't be, try not to be mean when you do it to people. Uh, right. People do come around. And the mood out there, the climate is changing, but not in the way that a lot of people would like it to in some huge mass movement of goodness and light. People are changing one, three, seven, twelve at a time. Uh, I was so moved by so many of the presentations in Portland two weeks ago. And one of the, I had so many high points. One of them was seeing two of my dearest friends who I haven't seen in years, who is um, Jim Re- Wiener and Charlie yes. Fulce, yes. who they're just the greatest guys in the world. They really are. And they have taken a lot of heat. And for those listeners who are not familiar with their names, they are two out of the four individuals who went through something referred to as the Allagash incident. They were not only abducted on a camping trip in northern Maine, they were abducted out of a moving canoe. And this really happened. And I also have to say here, Suzanne, is no matter how deeply involved I am in this, no matter how personally my involvement is for somebody that has not had this experience, no matter how many people I have worked with, or CAT scans and x-rays I have seen of implants, or scars and scoop marks that occurred overnight self-cauterized, or sitting with a mother, and in some cases a grandmother and a child, three generations, as they catharted together on this thing, all a privilege. I still, every year, several times a year, find myself saying to myself, and with all the attendant feelings that accompany it, my God, this is really happening. Mm -hmm. And I hope I never lose that ability and just see this as, oh, yeah, another abduction. abduction. Let's go over the details. Um, If I do, it'll be time for me to get out of the work. Well, I agree that it's undeniable. And what's happening is, I think... We are elevating the consciousness by talking about these things, allowing people to realize that there are possibilities other than what we've been taught since children to be. And I really appreciate everything that you've done in trying to help this move forward by coming forward publicly and having such passion and and attacking it with such grace. You are such a graceful speaker so eloquent so you're so humble and i want to thank you again peter robbins for joining <laughs> me today well, you're very i welcome. feel very honored that you graced me with your presence <laughs> honestly no no you I, I i looked at you at the conference and i just thought this guy is so cool <laughs> you, you speak so well you are my idol and I can't wow. wait to see you again. And oh, you too, sweetie. And I, I want you to share with the listeners um, any appearances that you have coming up in the near future. Uh, sure, I'd be glad to. Right now, I'm just prepping my ass off to get ready for this conference in Rome. I've got my three papers written, and they're now in Italy being translated because the nature of this conference is that Um, There's going to be a simultaneous, like United Nations level, translation as I say things word for word, pretty much. Wow. They're going to come out, which means I'm working from three 5,000 word scripts, which I will have pretty much memorized by the time I get there and refer to them as I need to, because there's no room for improvisation. So it was also a wonderful challenge of compelling me to write in a very technical manner at times, but also very conversational. My next appearance in the States is going to be Saturday, October 26th, 
at a, another um, first-time UFO conference that we're very much hoping uh, will be an annual. And how wonderful to have two annuals a month or so apart in the great area of New England. And that's um, the New England uh, UFO conference. Which I will be attending. All right. Well, that's excellent. <laughs> and that is due, you know, in the same way that Audrey Hewins absolutely has moved heaven and earth to create this second event. And um, with our help and the help of others, we will insinuate this as an annual event. And there will probably be other conferences in years to come pattern after it uh, in Portland every September. The wonderful, hardworking Steve Fermani, former uh, MUFON director um, for New England, um, this is his baby, and he has done a yeoman's job at pulling it together over the last year. He's just one of my favorite people in the work, and I can't say how proud I am of him for bringing this into reality. It's going to be a one-day event. Um, headlining uh, will be Stanton Friedman and Kathleen Martin. And for anyone who did not get to hear these two world-class presenters and brilliant authors and lecturers and two of the finest, most important people we have in the world in this field, uh, you will have a chance to do it in uh, at Lemonster City Hall in Lemonster, Massachusetts. Um, I'll be speaking as well, as well as Mark Antonio and Robert Schroeder, probably one or two other presenters. Would you happen to have a website address where people well, can yeah. actually purchase tickets? Yes. Um, if you go to N-E-U-F-O-C-O-N, short for New England UFO Con, everything is right there. And I want that place packed. It's a very modest price. It's going to be a tremendous one-day program for any of our friends who can attend, who joined us uh, two weeks ago in Maine. You see a lot of the same faces, and that'll be wonderful as well. And I'd also like to say for any of my friends and Facebook friends in Rome who are, who are in Europe who can get to Rome for this conference – I'll be posting details on it on my Facebook page or in the next week. It would be wonderful to see you there. I'm already very excited. I have a couple of um, colleagues who are um, Italian scientists uh, who I last spoke with at an international conference uh, on Reich's discoveries in central Greece two years ago. And I'm so looking forward to seeing them again as well as uh, my best friend in Spain and some UFO colleagues uh, in Europe. It's going to be very exciting for me, and I will find time to hopefully post some pictures while I'm there. Oh, I'm sure you will. And I've got a few days off to at least begin to see a little bit of Rome. I am definitely not thinking about this as my trip to Rome, but my first trip to Rome. Oh, is it really? Yeah, and I'm pretty well traveled. I've visited, I think, about 30 countries over the years, but I'm embarrassed to say... This is my first trip to Italy, so cut me some slack. <laughs> um, but, yeah, um, what I'd like to do, Suzanne, yes. is, um, you know, in a couple of months when you have an opening, return to the show and we can pick up where we've left off. Perfect. And thank you for being such a first-rate host and oh, well, for please. asking the questions you have. You know, listen, there's so many more. I mean, literally, as we do these things, we write these notes that never get touched so I'll put these in a little lockbox for next time. How's that? <laughs> you got it. Sounds great, Peter. Well, I will see you next month. And thank you, everyone, for listening to Random Alien Brain Droppings. I'm Suzanne Chancellor with Peter Robbins. Have a great day. Stop.